から見るか。<笑>
I think it was love at first to hearing his voice. Oh, that's let's talk about the phone call. Yeah. So it took us like literally weeks and weeks before we'd even have a phone call. And so when we finally had that phone call, it honestly melted my heart. <laughs> you guys know her voice is like butter. <laughs> and as a chef, I can appreciate that. <laughs> and so when she would speak and, and I heard her voice on the other end of the phone, I just knew that this was someone that was supposed to be in my life. And, you know, by the grace of God, we met and here we are. Uh, we absolutely, absolutely are just in love with our love. And uh, we, I think the thing that complements our relationship the most is the appreciation that we have for each other's art, each other's creativity. And literally, it's, it's like having the best of both worlds where you're able to balance everything you could possibly ever come out of your creative mind uh, with the other person. That's great. <laughs> How did you get interested in cooking? Oh, I, I was interested from the minute I could smell my mom's and oh, my right? mom's cooking. Yeah. I was a little kid and I would hang out in the kitchen all the time and I just could not help myself because the food was so good. <laughs> I was like, man, I want to learn to do this. It was irresistible. <laughs> so you know, my, my, my grandmother's, you know, Catalonia, you know, from Barcelona. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then my mom, she, she actually was taught by my grandmother. My grandmother, my dad used to take her to his mom's house to teach her how to cook. So right? she, she got a lot of good. Yeah. But then she had a lot of Mexican influence also. Yeah. And so a lot of the skills that she attained were through her relatives from Mexico. Uh, okay. Do you know what happens to cilantro when it starts to sprout? No. What it looks like? So this is nice fresh cilantro. See how nice and yeah. pungent the leaves yeah. are? Mm -hmm. So when it's sprouting, you see these little buds and it starts to look like parsley. Yeah. You know what curly yeah. parsley looks like? Sure. And that's what it looks like. So you want to make sure that it doesn't uh, have any of that. Okay. Okay. And then you always smell it. You smell it. How strong it is. Oh yeah. And that's usually. I mean, <laughs> you'll always catch me in the store smelling cilantro. <laughs> so then when you chop this, I mean, this is literally just a, a rough chop. All you do is like smash it down, just like that. Mm. And I'll let you go out and use. Okay. And once you do like all the way across, then you'll come back and then you do a cross. Okay. Yeah. Keep your uh, hand out of the way. So, uh, I see. I see. And the one thing people do wrong with cilantro is they cut it too much. That's about all you need to cut cilantro. Just give it just a rough cut. Mm -hmm. It's just a rough. So now you got it across from you. You're just going to cut it in half. There you go. Turn it lengthwise, vertically. Now you're going to hold it like this. Knife point down, and you just, this is the cut. This is Julienne. You want to watch me do one? Yeah. Knife is down, just push it over. Knife down, push it over. And you just do that through the whole length of it, and you cut the whole thing. For this application, it's, it's a chopped onion. The, the Asians don't fine dice their onions when they put it in the dish. You yeah. see it, right? yeah. you see the peppers, you see all this. So to do that, real simply, all you do is you're gonna cut it literally in like almost inch to inch and a half wide cuts along the bias. See what I'm doing with the knife? Mm -hmm. I'm pointing at the direction of the onion, just like that. Now it's ready to chop, this is how you finish. Watch this, you're done. That's the Asian cut for a stir fry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it, That's right? Nice. All right, your turn. The knife point is, is one of the most important strokes because you, that's what um, secures, okay. secures the piece to the, to, the, to the table. So when you always start with that knife, see that? See the contact? Yeah, yeah. And then you just swipe down like that. There's lots of different chilies used in, in Asian cooking. Um, the jalapeno is probably one of the most versatile. It can be used for lots of things. You know, a lot of it has to do with the heat factor. Yeah. Some of them are hotter than others. The Asian, the Thai chilies are some of the hottest in the world, to yeah. be honest. But um, 
My question is, why does people, why do people like something burning hot food? Burning hot food. I, you know, it's an acquired taste. Number one, and number two, if you balance the heat with the sweet, so you kind of mix a little bit of savory in it. Gotcha. It, it it's not. Ah. It's a little more palatable. Ah, okay. I mean, for me, I've never been a fan of just like you know, burn my tongue off hot. Yeah. I never have. But I use chilies. They're very good for your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. health-wise, I mean, you know, some of those Asian populations live longer than anyone in the world, so they must be doing yeah. something right, you know? All right, so the jalapeno, in this case, is used more as a garnish, but you can also cook with it. Mm -hmm. So we've washed it, and all you do with this one is just slice it, hold it in place, and slice it in a nice quarter-inch little rings, okay? So then stack your rings, and then just cut them in half. You hold the whole stack, watch. See that? Yeah. Like, kind of like a pyramid. Yep. Now hold it in place, just take the knife down. Just like that. So, uh, the most important thing about a citrus fruit is the feel of the skin. So when you go to buy a, a lime, mm -hmm. you don't want the bright green, thick skin that limes Feel that, just touch it. See how nice and yeah. soft it is? Yeah. That's full of juice inside. Right. When you buy those hard, thick skinned limes yeah. that are bright green, yeah. there's hardly any juice in them. Oh. That's the trick there. Yeah. So then to release to release the juice in the lime, you want to roll it with your hand, just like that. Just practice that and you can feel it. It loosens the membranes inside the lime and now it's now it's gonna be nice and juicy. Mm. So then with, with the lime, we're going to use about half of it for the, uh, for the action. This is a nice little tool. This t where do you think this tool was invented? No. Mexico. Kidding me. They used to make these, the, the, the original juicer like this uh -huh. was literally made out of wood. It was a wood plank that they had carved out. Oh, and okay. that's where, and so the trick to this is you've cut it in half, you lay the, the most side down just yeah. like that you've got a nice flat surface for it to squeeze into mm -hmm. and so that's that's how you get your juice okay yeah. so we have rice noodles we use tamari soy uh, because it's gluten free one of the things i like to do is i like to cook with gluten free and allergen free ingredients the reason because somebody's going to ask for gluten free absolutely my wife would ask for gluten free sure. <laughs> So tamari soy, guys, it's gluten free. Okay. I've got a little bit of honey, some sesame oil, some rice vinegar, a good brand peanut butter. You want the creamy style. Mm -hmm. So these are ingredients that are going to make the sauce. However, if you're in a rush, you can buy a sauce. This is by Zhang. <laughs> it's a Bangkok peanut sauce. Mm. That's what you would use for yeah. for a Thai dish. Rice noodles, any rice noodle will work, they're pretty much all the same. Yeah. Uh, these are a little better quality rice noodle, non-GMO, gluten-free, you can see all the stuff on mm -hmm. the box. And so these are called, they're also called bean breads, but they're rice noodles. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, so you want the water to get hot, almost to the point where it boils. When it starts to boil, you shut it off. Yeah. The reason you do that is because you don't want to overcook the noodles. If the noodles get overcooked, it'll be really tough to even get them out of the pan, okay? So the cooking process, um, we'll start that here in a second, but we still need to prepare the meat. So pad thai, you can do shrimp, mm -hmm. pork, beef, I mean, pretty much any protein you want. You can even do tofu if you want. Uh, in this case, we're gonna do pork chops. Let me, I take a center cut pork chop, okay? It's fresh, all natural, mm -hmm. boneless, nothing to it, and I use that for my protein. I'll tell you why. It's very easy to cut these chops. And I'll even let you do one when I get through these. Watch how I cut them because this is like an Asian cut for the chops also. Uh, but it's simple. You ever notice the Asian meats are usually very thin, very, so they don't have to be completely thin, but with this, in this case, what I do is I slice it like this. See that? Mm. Nothing to it, no mess, no fuss. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be a lot of work when I cook it, and it's easier to handle, okay? 
Okay, so that's yeah. that's why I like to use you know the boneless skin as pork chops. Okay. Uh, okay. Alright, so I use ginger, a uh, little garlic, granulated garlic, some crushed red pepper. Then I'm going to use some of our ingredients here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hit it with some oil. So a little bit of sesame oil. Not a lot, it's very strong. A little bit of rice vinegar. Sorry about the slam there. So this is what helps mm -hmm. tenderize the meat. A little bit of tamari. Some of this. So yeah, a lot of people don't put their finger over the. Yeah, a little granulated <laughs> garlic. I do it because you don't want it to pour out. Right, right. right. I'm gonna say and, it, and this one's a shaker, so it's not yeah. that big a deal. Are those chili flakes? Yeah, okay. crushed red pepper crushed flakes. Red pepper. And then some nice granulated ginger. ginger. Cool. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, if you have time, you can just kind of massage it in there like a rub. Mm -hmm and it'll take on all those flavors. As an executive chef, I think you shared with Frank in that earlier segment, you shared with him about how you got started yeah. in the kitchen with your mom. Yeah, mom, mom was a great cook. Uh, you know, I don't think my siblings would agree to begin with, <laughs> to be honest. My dad, uh, my dad would take her and, uh, and have his mom, uh, who, who is, uh, Part Spanish taught her all the skills she had, and uh, we would spend summers at her house, and just all the aromas and everything that we ever had to cherish as kids. I mean, you did not want to miss a meal, <laughs> and that's and that was my love for food. I mean, when I was a little kid, I, I I probably am the sibling that spent the most time in the kitchen. My body showed it. I mean, I was this short, stocky little fat boy uh, because I ate everything in sight. <laughs> <laughs> And it was all good. <laughs> so, you know, our summit has inspired creativity. And I know that um, your parents inspired you not only just in your cooking and your creativity, but also in your spirituality. So, oh, yeah. Um, can you tell our audience about that? Yeah. Uh, you know, some of you know, some of you may not know. Uh, I was born a PK. PK stands for Preacher's Kid, uh, for those of you that don't know. And uh, you know, to be honest, it was such a such a blessed life, and and the same at the same time a cursed life. I mean, we had the best of both worlds, and also all the social pressures that came with it. Uh, but my parents, I mean, it's just um, they're my heroes. And the true heart of an artist. I mean, you're the real deal. You're the real, you know, you really feel through your creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, you, you wrote a screenplay about your parents. I did. So my father passed, you know, probably some 20 some years ago. And when my mother passed, uh, I had always vowed to them, to, to, to my God, <laughs> that I would tell her story. And so that was the first screenplay I wrote. Uh, it's called No Misfortunate Son. But it's the story of how two, you know, really troubled Latin Americans lived in abusive situations and, and flourished. They, they met each other, they fell in love, and uh, once my father had committed his, his life uh, to, to serving God and to being a pastor, uh, and he had met my mother and they were married. It was just, it was a match made in heaven. I mean, there were fireworks, you know, my parents, just like anybody else, were all normal people. Uh, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, but they stood by each other without a doubt, ever. And so I got to, I got to see the love of God modeled through my parents. And not a lot of people can say that. And it's, uh, it's hard to talk about it because <laughs> it chokes me up. But uh, we were blessed. We were so blessed. And to be honest, like my sister Ruth and I, we joke all the time. We talk all the time. Same thing with my brothers. But uh, Ruthie made a really fun comment the other day. She's like, 
we didn't even know we were poor. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, that's how good a life we have. You know, because back I never really grew up with an appreciation for things. <laughs> Carol can vouch for this. I'm really very much a minimalist. Uh, until you uh, met me. Until I met her. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think I've had a lifelong passion with, with food. I've had a lifelong passion with God. Uh, I can say that, you know, from a very young age, uh, when I, you know, surrendered my life to Christ, I was still a child, but I felt, honestly, the burden of the world on my shoulders because I knew that God had something bigger for me in my life, something that I was supposed to do, something that I was supposed to say. And so I've lived my life, or tried to, with purpose my entire life. Uh, and on purpose, <laughs> I'll say, because, uh, I mean, yeah, talk about my career. I, I, um, I was a business major at ASU, and about my third year into it, I just was not into it. I was always interested in cooking. I had always worked my way through school and line cook jobs, dishwashers, all the, all the grunge work jobs, but I always had a passion for that business, and uh, I got a phone call from a friend and said, uh, they're auditioning for an apprentice and these opportunities only come up every four years because they take one apprentice in uh, at the Phoenix Country Club and this was a time back in the day when they still had master chefs and kitchens that taught people so I got to learn the old-school way hands-on with a master chef that was my training I fell in love with my well, with four master chefs, right? Yeah. And they was, all spoke different languages. Everyone spoke a different language. <laughs> there was only one chef in the kitchen that spoke English, and so you had to pick up some languages fast. So how many languages can you speak? Well, I mean, fluently, I can only speak like three, but, you know, I can still dabble in a few of the other ones. Yeah. But, uh, I, yeah, I feel comfortable in those. I like it when he speaks Italian, too. <laughs> Vorrei un altro giorno in la cinque terra. Si, that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been something else. Yeah. Well, um, I have seen you really minister to a lot of people in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, and I've heard a lot of stories, and I've met a lot of people that have actually mentored under you. Their careers have taken off, um, and they really... You know, they really feel like you and, and, and your faith and your consistency with them has really helped them just really taken off. So can you speak to our audience a little bit about mentoring people, not, not only just in, you know, in becoming chefs, mm -hmm. but then also in their faith? And, right. And, yeah, I, you know, in, you know, in all honesty, it, it was something that I was uh, shy about at first. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll... I'll basically say it right here, I'm an introvert, I've always been an introvert, I could live in a box and nobody bothered me and I'd be good. COVID, I got that. <laughs> Shelter in place, no worries. Okay, so, but, you know, I was tasked with the mission of mentoring chefs, mentoring, you know, young, young folks, right from the get-go, um, and so I took it on as this was my mission. This was my mission field, and those of you that worked with me, you know, we lived through a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen the worst of the worst that has happened to people, lives broken, marriages, addictions, suicides, I mean, you name it. The kitchen is tough. It's tough. The kitchen and it's, is tough. And it's not for the faint of heart. And, yeah. and, and in all honesty, uh, I, I, felt, I felt like this fire welling up in me when I was presented with those opportunities. To literally minister, literally pray with some of my staff, talk to them on a, on a real level, and just help them understand that the love of God is the greatest thing in the world. And to have that, aside from anything else, it's just, that's the blessing. There are two things you can't live without. That's it. Fresh, organic food and unconditional love. <laughs> I want to take us now to um, back into the kitchen with Tim and Frank. 
So stage all your ingredients by the pan that you're going to saute in. First thing we're going to do is we're going to do the we're going to actually make the sauce. Um, you always want a hot pan before you get started. Make sure it's good and piping hot. Uh, over here, the water is probably already at a temperature that's good enough for the uh, noodles because you start to see the bubbles like it's about yep. to. Yep. So now I'm going to shut that water off. And I'm going to put the noodles in. Now this is, this is about enough noodles for about eight servings. So we're only doing four this time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use half the noodles. Yep. Drop them right in there. The pan gets hot pretty fast. You're asking me about pans. So I've used the Cafalon for quite some time. What I like about them is they're consistent. It's a solid metal. It never changes. Sure. I've used these pans for, I couldn't even tell you how long. All right, so then a little bit of oil okay. to give it that Asian touch, a little bit of the sesame oil. Rice vinegar. And you've got the recipe attached yep. for those of you that are going to make this at home. Once it gets good and hot, turn it down a little bit. Doesn't need to burn. Kamari soy. The recipe calls for sriracha. I like to use the actual chili garlic uh, as another alternative. And that's the part, of course, that gives it the heat. So it's about, you know, four tablespoons. And then lastly is the peanut butter. And you want about twice what you did in chili. So all you're doing is warming the sauce. It's not, it's just, you're not, this isn't the finished product. Uh, it's actually going to be finished. Does the peanut butter have any effect on the heat of the sauce? When you cook with it, the density Will, will burn if you're not careful. So okay. you gotta be careful when you're making the sauce. So yep. You do that. That's why I turned it down. Now I'll turn it back up a little bit. And you just mix it in. Some of the rules I break, I break them often. And the reason is because I've learned how the ingredients react. Mm -hmm. uh, in a normal sense, you would see someone here just like flash frying this thing and, yeah. and then be like, and then they're going to go cook with it. Well, guess what that does to the ingredients? You've broken down the ingredients so much that now when you add it to your dish, it's going to have a whole different texture and taste. Mm -hmm. So in our application, we're just doing this. And what I like to do is, I don't tell people, is I usually share a recipe, but a chef will always leave an ingredient out. <laughs> in this case, I will share the ingredient and I'll let you guess what the secret sauce is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so there's our there's our paste. Looks like that. Okay, that's our paste. The noodles are probably nice and soft by now. You just want to check them by pulling them up, and you want to loosen them, okay, and just break them apart in there mm -hmm. so that they all get the nice heat through them. Just get your hand down to about the pan. You can feel when it radiates the heat, it's mm -hmm. hot. It's hot. Any preferences on the olive oil? Uh, I'll tell you what is you want the extra virgin is literally for eating raw. It should be robust, pungent. It should be, you know, I mean, some of, you know, it's nice to find a good organic one because it's usually got a nice flavor, taste mm -hmm. to it. Uh, the lighter ones are good for cooking. Uh, in this application, a lot of times they, they use vegetable oils, canola oils, things like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a lot of that in my house, so I use olive oil for almost everything. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so when you're cooking vegetables, always go with the ones that are going to be the toughest to cook or the ones that need to cook the most. However, if you have garlic and onion in a dish, you always want to do those first. The reason is because it adds a seasoning to the rest of the vegetables. And you want them cooked. You don't right. want them undercooked. As you know, 
<laughs> yeah, some people can't metabolize it. So this is just going to be crystal clear. Pardon the hands, but I have hot hands. I literally can stick my hand in a pot of boiling water uh -huh. without it bothering me. I a lot of gas, so why don't I use cooking utensils? Well, my hand is a cooking utensil. Yeah. <laughs> While I'm doing that, come over here, peel the noodle. Yeah, it's soft. Yeah. That's about as much heat you want on the noodle. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and give that a stir. So I'm draining the rice noodles so that we can toss them in the dish. Okay. Uh, that's good. That's ready. All right, so now basic saute. So people complicated. It's not that that difficult, except this is a big pan, you yeah. gotta have a strong wrist. It's a flip, just like that. You push it away from you, <laughs> and then you push it to you. Now try it. You uh -oh. can do it with both hands. <laughs> All right. So it's a sweep that way, and back at you. Uh -oh. Almost. Uh -oh. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Put it on the head. You got it. <laughs> Those are cooked. So now we go to the garlic, and we add a little ginger. And this goes this goes a couple times, so you want to make sure that it's, that it's in there. Turn the heat down a little bit. The other thing they always say is add the aromatics last. The aromatics are ginger, cilantro lime juice, all that type of stuff. I like to get these ingredients in there to start with, like I said, because I'm seasoning my pan for the sure. dish. Yeah. That's my little tip. <laughs> <laughs> so then you get to that point. Now you can add the vegetables. And we actually don't need all of this. We probably need about half of it. Yep. As the recipe calls for. I'll go ahead and put all the carrots in because we've got a little bit less of that. The heat from the other vegetables will cook the vegetables enough, but citrus or lime juice, mm. that'll cook it down a more. A little bit more acidic, jalapenos, and that's going to also break it down. So just like the noodle, you want the texture of the vegetable to get a little bit loose, okay, nice and soft, before you start cooking the rest of it. Yeah. The reason is that you don't want it too, too al dente when you're uh, going to actually serve the dish. Okay. And at this point, it's okay to stir it around. That's gonna, the steam's going to help it to loosen up and yeah. soften faster. The timing seems really important in everything. Yeah, it's it really important. Managing the time is a, a, you know, a, a trick. Yeah, because in, in a split amount of seconds, you can literally lose your dish yeah. because you overcooked it or you pull it too soon and you undercooked it. See all the steam happening in the pan? Yep. Yeah. Those noodles are ready. Now I'm going to cook the protein, but I'm going to take those veggies out of there for a second. Now my pan's nice and seasoned, ready for all this other love that's going to go in it. I'm going to add a little bit more. Well, so there's our nice marinated pork. And with this, you stir it around. Let every piece get the surface of the pan. You're almost searing the meat. You got the pan pot. You're not overcooking it. You let it sear one side for two to three minutes, and then you get the flip. And that one flip is all you need, and then it sears the other side. Mm -hmm. Flip. Like that. Even it out again. And you really can visually see the pork yeah. just about cooked. Some pieces are not. That's okay, they're going to cook. 
same thing. You can use the lid. And now it's going to steam the a little bit. Soften it back up. Yeah. And then you can get a nice texture. Just a little bit, not a lot. It's just like surgery. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, see the board? Yeah. Sauce into the pan. And you say, what's wrong with this sauce? What's missing? Well, it's Chef Tim's secret of the <laughs> A nice organic light oh, yeah. coconut milk. Coconut milk. I don't know. Guess that one. Yep. Yeah. So you let it. Stew down a little bit. I like coconut. I use them a lot in a lot of dishes. Mm -hmm. People are like, oh, that's not pad thai. Well, it's something that I learned to do. Mm -hmm. And you can ask my wife. She loves my pad thai. <laughs> See how nice and creamy it got? Yeah. That's the love I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about as far as it has to go. Now you turn the heat down to about medium. You're going to add your noodles. When you get to this point, there really isn't a lot of sauteing going on because you're literally making this nice mm -hmm. pad thai, which essentially is a, almost a stew with all these nice little ingredients. I remember traditional pad thai has the the uh, bamboo shoots yeah. or bean sprouts. It's got it's got a nice noodle, so it's got that noodle taste. But this stuff literally just blends in. Yeah. Turn it up a little bit, get it going again. God, this is really healthy looking stuff. Can't need any lid. Yeah, all good veggies, yeah. protein. Very healthy dish. So the last thing, aromatics. Right. Okay, a little cilantro. At this point, see it's nice, bubbly, mm -hmm. everything's cooked. I'm gonna shut it off now. And so I get the cilantro in there, a little bit of the scallion. So part of it I cook with, the other part I garnish with, okay? Yep. The other ingredient that's in the recipe um, is uh, the cooked egg, which is also a traditional pad thai. If you like that cooked egg, feel free to do it. I don't put it in because my wife can't eat eggs. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you just, at some point in time here? You so you, you would have cooked the egg ahead of time, like you scramble it a little gotcha. bit. Yeah. And you just cut it up so it's like nice and thin. Uh -huh, okay. And then you would just right now add it to the dish yeah. and you'd have it. There you go. Pad Thai pork. That's beautiful. Chef Tim. <laughs> so we're going to dish it up now. And the last little bit of garnish that we do is the nice chopped peanuts over the top. Mm -hmm. or whatever else you want to put in there. Granulated nuts. If you have an allergy, you can't eat it. Don't put it in. Yep. Want a little bit more heat. A little bit of jalapeno. They don't have to eat it. They can always pick it up. Yep. And then a little bit more cilantro. And a little scallion. And a nice little lime wedge. Voila. There we go. Look at that. Mm. Amazing. Huh? Beautiful. Thank there you, you go, my friend. Thank you, sir. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bon appetit. We got to enjoy the most amazing, beautiful dinner with Frank, and the food was absolutely fantastic. So if you missed the special ingredient, Remember, a chef doesn't put all of his ingredients in the recipe, so you are going to get the recipe below. There is a link to get Tim's recipe, his free gift for you. However, he was a little sneaky, and he left out an ingredient. So, it, this is our dog back here, <laughs> making some noise. Bring Jack, come here, Jack. Come back up and say hi to everybody. There we go. This is our baby. There we go. Oh, good oh boy. So Daddy left out uh, a major ingredients. So this table wasn't always here in the kitchen. And these glasses weren't always here. And I know this sounds really weird, but uh, we had to move from California back to Colorado. We moved back and forth a lot. We live in both states. And on one of our moves, we had a catastrophe. And so, uh, you want to tell the story? Uh, sure. <laughs> a big catastrophe.
catastrophe. <laughs> it wasn't a small one. So when two fine art gallery owners from Northern California oh, wait, have their so entire... <laughs> I'm going to back up here. So what he's doing is he's giving you the pitch for the movie we wrote about our really big catastrophe. So we had a, our move, let me say, our move was heisted and held ransom. Like everything we owned was held ransom. And so we decided to write a screenplay about it a few years later and it's called Bad Move. Q. Okay. So two fine art gallery owners uh, from Northern California had their entire move and collection of art heisted by the Russian mob. And they refused to pay the ransom and they enlist the help of their own unscrupulous friends to, get, to have the goods returned. Unfortunately, what happened is <laughs> the mob was actually for real. And this is a true story. It's a true story and it's a story that we decided that we were right. Uh, we actually did it while we, when we went into COVID <laughs> and everybody, you know, everybody's jobs came to a halt. Uh, we sat at our favorite cottage in Carmel and decided we were going to write the story. And it, and it was a reason, the reason we did it was to heal from our wounds because it was pretty traumatic, to be honest with you. It was. We, we uh, got here to Colorado and we only had what was in our suitcases. Now, of course, I'm a woman and I packed a big suitcase. <laughs> And we had, I have a huge suitcase and my dog and Tim being the minimalist, remember he said he's a minimalist? <laughs> he packed in a little bag like this <laughs> and that's all we had with painting. Oh. Um, you were awarded by Jacques Pepin. My very first uh, outing as a chef uh, in, in a culinary competition was at the Scottsdale Culinary Festival uh, and uh, I was the first one to win by unanimous decision the Mayor's Culinary Cup. And my presenter, Jacques Pepin, <laughs> said that it was just off the charts amazing. And so uh, that piece too, you can see it uh, at the website. Um, it, was a, uh, it was an old English chessboard that I had done. And the base of it was a, like a soccer tort, which is a raspberry bittersweet chocolate truffle cake. Uh, the top of it, all in chocolate. And all the pieces, each piece was was hand carved and sculpted to look like old English uh, chess pieces. Uh, each one of them took probably close to 11 hours. And so imagine all the pieces and when it was done. But that's what springboarded my career. Uh, I got a lot of notoriety out of it. And, you know, thankful to God that, you know, it happened because it literally launched my career. After that, I was getting phone calls left and right and offers everywhere. So I was, I was gifted the art of painting. Uh, I always had an intrigue with being able to paint. Uh, I never was very skilled at it, but uh, I had the luxury of being taught how to paint on chocolate by a sugar artist. His name is Andre Renard. Uh, he's from Paris. He actually worked at Maxime's and a lot of very famous restaurants and hotels in, in France. Uh, he showed me the basics and said, this is how you do this, this is how you do that. I took it a whole different <laughs> direction and decided to do full-blown, uh, full masterpiece art. And so for a while I was actually doing uh, Monet's and Van Gogh's. And this one, some of you will recognize, is a Renoir. Uh, it's Dance at Bougainville. And it's one of my amazing pieces of art that I had the gift and the blessing to be able to do. Yeah, for me, I mean, it's all, it's, you know, God's canvas. I mean, this entire world, everything that happens, happens for a reason. There's so many different things, uh, you know, all the struggles we go through, but God gives us a mission to create, really to create our world. Uh, that we live in and, and everything we do is, is by choice. Um, sometimes things are decided for us, but I think when we, when we take, you know, what God has given us and actually literally focus our energies on what it is he wants to do through our work, that's when you're co-creating. That's when you're in your element because what do they say? We're the hands and feet of God and, uh, 
and sometimes we're the, the brush and the canvas, you know, sometimes we're the dish. I mean, for me, it's been a blessing to be able to bless others with my cooking. I've had a lifelong love affair with food, and I'm not shy to admit it, but my biggest passion has been blessing people with my cooking. I am the most spoiled woman on the face of the planet. And he's a massage therapist. So <laughs> I've got a chocolatier, an executive chef, and a massage therapist. <laughs> so eat your heart out. <laughs> it's both a blessing and a curse, I tell you. <laughs> yes, we will. We will go there. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, um, I really loved having you all here. I wanted to bring you into my home and I wanted you to experience um, this amazing man who I get to call my husband and the love of my life and I just wanted you to just to have a sneak peek. Mm -hmm. I hope that you really um, enjoyed the cooking lesson. Your link will be below where you can grab the recipe. Remember there's a secret ingredient and um, I thank you so much for joining us for the summit. Tomorrow, I will be popping back into your inbox just as a thank you, and I'll be giving you a gift as well. So it's a surprise day, a surprise video, and it will be short, but I just want to make sure that you're really taken care of, that you get all the gifts that you need. If you missed any of the videos, um, you can upgrade still to VIP, and you'll have the videos for life. And if you have any questions, you can email me at carolfraser at carolfraser.com. Thank you so much for being part of this summit. Thank you for coming into our home and for meeting my hubby. <laughs> and darling, you look marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. <laughs>